So I'm going to cast it open to questions and comments. I'm going to sort of sweep the room. Um, if you could keep it short, I'd like to get as many people as possible and also give time for Helen to respond in some. Um, so can I start? And please do say who you are so Helen has an idea. I'll start this end and I'll sweep through. Uh, thank you very much indeed. My name is Steve Wagan. I work with Aviva Investors, one of the biggest uh, investment firms in the world. Um, we were very pleased to see in the outcome document from Rio a uh, reference to corporate sustainability reporting, particularly paragraphs 47, but also elsewhere. Um, what conversation have you heard so far around the role of corporate transparency and accountability? We're particularly concerned to get corporate performance on, it, on their own sustainability issues so that we can value companies properly and make sure that the markets are working appropriately. But mm. I, so far, I've heard very little conversation about that. I, I hope you can reassure me. Mm. Mm. Okay. Can we take that one straight away, or should we keep Take, take, yeah, a, group take a few more. Yeah. Right behind you, please, and then I'm going to come to the centre of the room. Helen, thank you very much. My name is Henrietta Korb. I'm the CEO of the Shuri Blair Foundation for Women. Just a quick question on financial inclusion and where we are on that and whether that's part of the jobs and growth discussion um, you refer to because 2.7 billion of people have no access, obviously, to financial services. Mm. So that would be great to get your insights on that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Neva Freshville from Beyond 2015. Um, two quick questions. One on, do you have any fear that the focus on sustainable development um, will mean that poverty eradication is lost? And secondly, how do you see equality and um, the difficulty in using that in kind of an, a goal format or indicator in mm. the post-2015 framework? Shall I digest Take these three now? <laughs> <laughs> um, Firstly, from, from Rio, I mean, you get the companies that really want to engage around sustainability going, and I think there were some, some great commitments made at, at Rio by, by companies, and, and people are really leaders on, on the sustainability agenda. I'm not a, across the discussions the Global Compact is having at the moment. Paul, have you got any, any feedback on, on that, on where uh, that's injecting into the agenda at the moment? Just take come take up the and mic. Uh, take yeah. the mic. Yeah. I would just say two very quick things. Um, we don't lose everything from Rio just because we've started these post 2015 consultations. So everything that happened in Rio, the commitments made by companies, the uh, dialogue that preceded it is being brought very much into this same conversation, yeah. partly because of the need to have now an integrated global agenda that covers these issues. Mm. Um, what I would say, though, is that business um, compared to civil society has not yet. Uh, really participated in this discussion as fully as they might. There are strong leaders on the high-level panel. Paul Pullman from Unilever definitely pushing this. But we need to bring them much more quickly into this conversation to get the real coalitions and shared perspectives and analysis that we need to come up with a successful framework. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just repeat, this whole debate's going to go on for another uh, 20 months. <laughs> you know, we're talking the Open Working Group reporting September 2014. So I think there is time for for a lot of input. But I, you know, I, I like the emphasis that came through the private sector um, discussions at, at at Rio on corporate transparency and accountability. And I, I think it you know can make a real contribution. Um, uh, Henriette is right to emphasise uh, the financial inclusion uh, issues again. You know, I think one <laughs> way in which this next agenda can be a lot stronger than the first one, is really focusing on the means of implementation. And financial inclusion is absolutely critical to meeting a, a range of goals, whether it is women's empowerment, poverty eradication, uh, wh whatever. So I think it, it's certainly identified as a critical means, whether it will end up with a goal and target is another matter. But uh, a limited number of things end up at goals and targets, but we all need to understand what it is that will actually drive progress uh, on them, and financial inclusion is indispensable. Uh, to be on 2015, um, the short answer is no, I am not concerned that poverty eradication, quote, will give way to, quote, sustainable development. Because I think there's a huge mistake made in talking about sustainable development as if it is the environment. Sustainable development is three strands. <coughs> it is the economic, the social, and the environmental. We have to push all these boats forward together. I feel very, very, very passionate about that. We cannot sustainably 
reduce poverty in a world that's wrecking its ecosystem. Uh, and that's a challenge on all of us. Uh, so I, I think you know, the balance has to be the balance that in the end, these major conferences from Stockholm through Earth Summit through uh, Joburg uh, Sustainable Development to Rio Plus 20 of poverty eradication in the context of sustainable development. That's what we've got to make real. That's what we've got to make possible. You know, there's been a lot of talking about that the last 30 years mm -hmm. and, uh, and not enough action. So the, the time is to really see these things as, as connected. And as for quality, well, I mean, in the end, it, it's, it's highly political, isn't it? But <laughs> it's highly political because there's a lot of inequality and it's been hidden behind the way we have reported on MDGs. And you cannot you know, continue to leave uh, a billion people behind. Yeah, so there has to be a strong mm. quality focus, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Mm. Um, before I go back to the audience, there's, um, there's a question come in um, by the web stream uh, from a compatriot of yours, actually. What time is it in New Zealand? I do not know, but Ben Abram. It's quarter past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Ben. You're online. Uh, Otago Regional Director, P3 Foundation from Dunedin, uh, New Zealand, asks, how will the UN ensure that the opinions of young people are included in the development of the framework and not merely gathered as a token gesture? So I'll leave that one with you. Very short, please, and then I'm going to go out. Just a very quick point. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Academic researchers and it is common knowledge anyway that um, you cannot eradicate poverty without eradicating conflict. And people, oppressed people, have no uh, international mechanisms, including MDGs, have absolutely no meaning for oppressed people. For example, Tamils in Sri Lanka have oppressed for 65 years. Now they are like in the Hillsborough. In so Sri Lanka has become a Hillsborough for Tamils. All the Tamils from the coastal areas are pushed inside, and the army okay. camps and navy camps are put there. Nobody is talking about it, madam. OK, thank you very much. There's a key question there. Go to Baroness Kinner. Glenn Skinner, member of the House of yes. Lords and on the Council of the ODI. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Helen, for the insights that you give us here today and, and in everything you say and, and write. Uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing, on because you didn't mention it, and it rarely is mentioned, the role of the BRICS. Because in mm. terms of what we can learn about tackling inequality, a country mm. like Brazil has led mm. the way uh, mm. in, in trying to ensure that marginalised, excluded people are mm. have a... a <coughs> More, more interest is, is taken mm. in them. Mm. Uh, and I, I see that, you know, on the panel there isn't, a, a, a c the BRICs are not represented, uh, and it doesn't seem to me that they're being heard or listened to, which mm. to me seems ra rather a, a pity. Mm. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Take, take that, and then I'm going to get Ma Malcolm to pass the... Uh, Claire, and then I'll, I'll get Helen yeah. to respond. Hi, I'm Claire Lee, and I run ODI's support the G7 Plus group of fragile states. I'm just interested uh, in your opinion, Helen, about how the, uh, mm. the peace building, the state building mm. goals and the concerns that fragile states have, have raised recently will be incorporated, if they will be, in the mm. post-MDGs. Thank mm. you. Mm. I should also say, if you've got suggestions that you think yes. Helen should hear, don't just expect her to give answers to all these things. Yeah. If you've got suggestions, please yeah. offer those too. Why don't you take um, them? Just Starting with the uh, compatriot mm. from Dunedin, who's <laughs> up at, uh, after midnight. Um, I think, uh, I mean, youth clearly should be being heard in the civil society com conversations that are being had uh, around the world, and youth tend to be heard more in social media because of mm. the demographic. But, Paul, there's a specific point we should make about youth now with a call for crowdsourcing and ideas. Mm. Well, yeah. all I would say, and people may be able to hear me without the microphone. Uh, no, they can't hear you online without the microphone. I think we should be quite clear that it's going to be governments agreeing this framework at the end. So questions around how will the UN ensure that uh, the views of young people are incorporated need to be directed very much at governments. And I think what uh, we as the system, working with partners, are trying to do is that those voices are collected and amplified and then you know, presented to decision makers so that those views stand a greater chance of being incorporated. Now, the, the global survey platform that Helen referred to earlier is called My World. Um, if you go onto the data analytics page, which Claire and I spend about 12 hours a day on, <laughs> you can disaggregate by individual age. You can do it from 0 to 5, from 5 to 16, any cut that you want across all countries, uh, across, all, uh, uh, across gender, across education level. 
and you can come up with the priorities that people are choosing, plus the ones that weren't in the survey as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be incredibly powerful in terms of saying to decision makers, ultimately, this is what young people want. This is the world that young people want. But let's be very clear, it's governments who are going to be deciding that at the end and whether to incorporate this in any framework. Thank you. And, and having led a government, can I say it is very important that people make a noise. You know, it's always, <laughs> always comforting when you're taking positions to know there's a crowd behind. Uh, so often I think you know, policy is debated in such elite forums that voices don't come through. And I think Paul is right. In the end, member states are going to agree on what this agenda is. So voices need to be heard. Young, old, male, female, from the whole you know, rainbow of humanity, as, as, it, as it were. Um, can I perhaps take the, uh, the issue pertaining to conflict together with Claire's point about the G7 plus countries? I popped up to Oxford last night to the Institute of uh, Ethics, War and Conflict, I think. Uh, are these uh, opposites? I don't <laughs> know. Um, <laughs> uh, to speak precisely about uh, conflict and, and development and you know, touched on the G7 plus uh, state agenda and the importance of uh, working with those states uh, to provide avoid relapses into conflict, which puts a lot of emphasis then on the state building, uh, civil society, uh, civic life building, uh, livelihoods, inequalities, <laughs> discrimination, marginalisation. I mean, I think a lot of the things that are so important to the recovery of a state that suffered from conflict are, are coming through in these thematic conversations. Uh, so I, I feel reasonably confident that the concerns of this, this group of states affected by conflict will not be uh, overlooked uh, at all. Uh, on Glenys' uh, question, um, I think there are some very interesting uh, developments in the BRICS on the equality inequality issues, uh, which um, are, I guess, widely known about in the development circles, but there's a, a lot to share and learn across the global south. And if I, if I could take each of them, I mean, Brazil is known for the initiatives, particularly launched in Lula's period and carried on now in President Dilma's uh, period, uh, on the cash transfers uh, for poor families, uh, which has played a very important role in, in pulling people out of, out of uh, poverty. Uh, India has the amazing, in my opinion, uh, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which reaches 46 million households multiplied by number per household, this is, this is very significant. Now, not all the work maybe would meet the definition of decent work, but it is putting income in people's pockets, often for the first time ever. It has equity components, it relates to environmental integrity, water conservation, reforestation, and so on. Very interesting. And people may have seen, uh, coming through on the news wires just in the last week or two in China, uh, an announcement about uh, lifting minimum wages by 40%. China is very worried about inequality. One of the things they particularly asked UNDP to uh, support thinking on was how to tackle the growing inequality in their country. So in these major emerging economies, there is action and there is a lot of debate on how to you know, stop the divisions running away and, and becoming very, very uh, polarising. Okay, thank you very much. I, was, I want to pass to Dirk, um, but before that, Tim um, Strawson from Development Initiatives based in Bristol here in the UK asks, um, how do we balance domestic and international responsibilities and financing for meeting the post-2015 framework when we finally agree on it, of course? And I suppose this raises issues about you know, where is the collective action pr problem most acute in a sense for some of these, some, for some of these challenges? Over to you, Dirk. Yeah, thank you very much, Alison, and uh, thank you, Helen, as well, for this, uh, this excellent uh, discussion so far. Um, my question is about, uh, about economics uh, and the role of economics in this, uh, uh, in this discussion, and in particular, following up on your comments on, uh, on, on uh, uh, what you mentioned on Rio Plus 20. Uh, I was there as well, and of course we were talking about economic, uh, social, and environmental uh, development, um, and I also made a case, therefore, thinking also through the economics uh, of this. Which, which, which is uh, important. And um, <coughs> it's, it's thinking through uh, what is important for uh, achieving uh, the many goals. And 
Um, and if you, uh, if you listen to LDC governments when they, when they come together, um, for instance, in 2011, when, when they thought about IPOA, the Istanbul Pro Program of Action, also a UN conference, they are talking about um, economic transformation, they're talking about productivity, they're talking about uh, investment, um, technology, uh, and, and, and a, a lot of goals and, uh, and, and measures, um, indicators to do with, the, with these sort of areas. And I think that's, that's something we could, we, could, we could take on board. And, and my question is, is what elements of IPOA uh, don't you like? Uh, so c couldn't we take that over and maybe think through maybe uh, <coughs> some rationalization of the, of the I IPOA goals uh, in order to think of some sort of tr structural transformation index, which, which is, uh, is an important su suggestion I'd like to table. Okay, could you hand it next door to you, um, to Andy, and then I'll come round. Thanks very much. Um, Andy Norton, ODI. Um, Helen, you were involved in a high-level panel which focused on issues of resilience. Um, and I'm interested, I mean, there are obvi obviously that can be a very broad concept, but it can also be brought quite narrowly down to issues of extreme weather, disasters, sustainability and climate resilient development. So I'm just interested in the how you see the resilience agenda intersecting with this exercise. Mm. Mm. Take, take those, because they're, they're all very yeah. chunky items. And as they're I said, we're still in chunky. the market for <laughs> suggestions here. <laughs> too. Oh, the, the, f the first one, I think, was online about domestic and yeah. international responsibilities for uh, financing. Well, I, I think the, the Pusan high-level forum on aid effectiveness was rather important mm -hmm. in, in this discussion uh, because you know, the penny is well and truly dropped that you have to stop talking about aid effectiveness and talk about development effectiveness, recognising that official development assistance is a tiny proportion of the resources that go into development. You know, development is also... Uh, uh, about investment, it's about trade, it's, it's about uh, migration and remittances, it's about many, many things, which brings you back into the policy uh, coherence uh, agenda as well. Uh, but uh, in financing development, uh, okay, Rwanda, which has a 40% hole in its budget at the moment because of the amount of donor support which was going in, is a not particularly typical example of a state with a very significant proportion of its budget coming from donors. For the, if we took the whole 177 uh, countries and territories that we operate in, most of them would have nothing like that. In fact, in many developing countries, the ODA that goes in would be infinitesimal. So it's, it's, it's not a factor. And you know, domestic resource mobilisation is what they do. They fund their <laughs> development. And uh, I think, you know, coming through from developing countries, what we're hearing is a very strong desire to go beyond aid uh, because they have generated the, the means to support uh, their own development, which is not to say there's not a place for aid. Aid can be, uh, if it's configured to be catalytic and support uh, developing the capacity to... to advanced human development can be very important, but inevitably uh, the, the emphasis is shifting towards domestic resource mobilisation, being bankable, uh, attracting investment, etc. I think that's the, the way of the world. Um, Dirk's question on uh, the economics of it, uh, yes, I, I guess the Istanbul Programme of Action of two years ago has a a strong uh, emphasis on uh, getting the kind of economic transformation uh, which will take LDCs out of that category and into, uh, into middle income emerging economy status, if you like. But I guess putting my UNDP and human development hat firmly on, I have to ask, what is the purpose of all this? Isn't it greater human development and well-being? And, uh, you know, isn't it important to keep looking beyond the tyranny of GDP as an indicator of progress? The Human Development Index was a significant innovation in that respect in weighting not only GDP per capita, uh, but also uh, indicators for education and health. I think the real challenge now is how we bring this environmental sustainability strand into uh, measurement of, of progress. 
And one of the innovations in the Human Development Index uh, since 2010 has to been to produce alongside it inequality adjusted index, gender inequality adjusted index, multi-dimensional poverty index. I think the challenge now is perhaps to get a sustainable development index where you'd also put in a weighting uh, on sustainability. So anyway, there's a lot of debate about this post Rio. It's been thrown over to the UN Statistical Commission. Uh, our own Human Development Report Office is, is looking at it. Uh, but I think you know we, we we have to come back to what 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 is the point of growth? <laughs> it, it has to be in the end uh, human well-being. Growth is a is a means. Uh, it's 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 not in my opinion an end end in itself. Um, on the resilience uh, question, I, I'm in the camp which takes a broad view. I, I did a, um, a lecture on this last year. I went to Cambridge for a day or two. And I took the, the view that you know, resilience is not just about resilience to national to natural hazard. Uh, it's also about the resilience in your economy to shock, the resilience in your society to shock. And uh, how do you build that, that, that broader res resilience? There is a tendency, I think, to reduce it to a, a natural hazard uh, prevention. But one of the lines I took in the lecture last night at Oxford was to say if we take a resilience approach to prevention and mitigation of conflict, you know, that, that leads you in a certain uh, direction for tackling the drivers of conflict. So I'm in the broad school. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was going to say there's a gentleman in the front, now there are three. Um, the gentleman in the blue tie I saw first, so, um, and then there's a lady at the back there, and then I'm going to speak around this side. Thank you very much. Mark Kennedy, World Society for the Protection of Animals. In the context of livelihoods and sustainability, the main productive asset of a billion of the poorest people is their animals. Enhancing the animals' welfare can improve their productivity and therefore enhance the assets of the people. So the question I would like to ask is, Helen, what do you see the role of animal welfare organisations being in human development? On the back row there, the lady with the small face. Thank you, Tricia Rogers. Um, thank you very much for your um, inspiring analysis and vision. I'm particularly excited by your um, uh, emphasis on disaggregating the figures and, and making sure that the most vulnerable don't get excluded, because they may not be very large in numerical terms. And um, we all know the unintended consequences that goals can have. And you know, in our own country here, Teachers will focus on the ones likely to get D at GCSE because it's better to push them over the border. It's easier to push them over a borderline than to go for the ones with E and F. So we really do need, we were asked for some con um, suggestions, and we really do need to make sure that the measurements in the goal include measurements not just of a borderline and pushing people across a borderline because then there's bound to be just a focus on the ones just below the borderline, but measurements of how one is increasing maybe proportionally or some way so that the people who are living in really, really extreme poverty won't ever reach the borderline but may get a lot of improvement and we can try and encourage to have work spent on them and energy spent on them, the hard to reach, the really vulnerable who so often get missed out. So I'm really excited that, you know, you're of course you're aware of it but that you're going to try and bring it into the goals. Great, great. Can you pass it quickly? Um, Penny Lawrence is back there. She's had her hand up for a long time. I missed you there. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get to everyone. You can see I'm running out of time. And then I'm going <laughs> to scoot this way. You can hate me rather than Helen for that. Uh, Penny Lawrence from Oxfam and Chair of ICRA. Thanks very much, Helen. And I think, uh, you know, huge support for the focus on inequality and the whole way of integrating resource scarcity and how it affects people. Fantastic. And we've got the beginnings of conversation around this resilience question that if the high-level panel have come up with this as a sort of, you know, what top one of, of two things to focus on. Um, but how resilience actually looks, uh, what, what it looks like in terms of violence and insecurity that has come up, I think is really uh, unclear. And I just really welcome your thoughts on what the development practice would look like um, and how therefore, you know, you need to do that thinking before you could include it in the millennium, in whatever it takes over from the millennium and development goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on the, the first issue around animal welfare, and uh, I, I haven't actually seen this 
come up at all. So I mean, it's important that you raise it because, uh, you know, thinking of what was flashing through my mind was uh, images of perhaps uh, you know, visits to the Amboseli uh, Basin and the impact of uh, the erratic climate there now on the Maasai herders and the, the change in livelihood patterns because you, you can't sustain the, the animal stocks that were there. And then the competition also between the, the, the animals of the pastoralists and, and the wildlife. I mean, you know, huge competition between uh, for the basic sustenance. So I, I think it is worth contemplating how these issues then play out on 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 human welfare and how we keep an emphasis on biodiversity and ecosystems consistent with humans being able to uh, sustain themselves as as well I can only totally endorse the comments about uh, disaggregating so that we really do do know that where people are missing out and and focus on on reaching them and I think you know, I'd like, like to also you know, really endorse the, the emphasis UNICEF has put on on reaching the very last child, you know, the, the very end of the road. And, uh, and it's been you know, very important, I think, in sharpening the whole UN development system up on this, this equity focus that you can't leave people behind. It sort of plays in, I guess, a bit to the concept of the universal social protection uh, flaw, by whatever means. Could be job, could be social protection, but uh, isn't there a, just a, a absolutely basic line below which no human being should ever fall? I think I think this is worthy of of discussion. I haven't uh, noticed whether that's come through in the discussions on inequality. Maybe it has. I haven't had a chance to look at it enough in depth. But I, there was an ILO commission that looked at the universal social protection flaw, and maybe we should you know go back and extract uh, some of the insights from from that. Uh, Penny and Oxfam, thank you for the work you did on planetary boundaries. I've dipped into your uh, <laughs> document many times since Barry Coates gave it to me in Auckland uh, uh, a while back. Um, how to uh, then get some of the issues about uh, resilience in terms of also peace and security in? Uh, in our thinking aloud after the lecture, Oxford last night, I, I floated one thought, which I, I'm not wedded to, but I you know, sort of put it up for discussion. It, it seemed to me that we've, we're used in, in these health goals to talking about avoidable mortality of infants and children, of uh, expectant mothers and mothers giving birth uh, from HIV, malaria, TB. We have a WHO goal around avoidable mortality reduction for NCDs. Uh, conceivably, you could think about avoidable mortality from disaster, natural hazards. Uh, and remember that the Hyogo decade on disaster risk reduction is also coming to an end in 2015, and that agenda is being renewed and must play into this agenda as well. And then, is it far-fetched to think about reducing avoidable mortality from armed violence. Mm. You know, we have uh, an estimated 526,000 deaths a year from armed violence, of which one in 10 are said to be in what we acknowledge as conflict zones or from terrorism, which would be the tiny contributor to it. The other nine in 10 come from plain, ugly armed violence, which is ripping a apart societies, particularly in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, could we, with a real focus on this, set targets around avoidable mortality, the reduction of deaths from armed violence, which of course would take us into the small arm treaty negotiations, the, the, the gender Geneva Declaration on armed violence and so on. But I just raised the thought, I mean, we know deaths can be avoided. Would that be a conceivable way of, of, of formulating things? I'm really sorry, everyone. Uh, I have been, uh, uh, I'm sure, an appalling chair because I haven't been able to get to all of you. But this was always going to be a time constrained segment. I think we've had an incredibly rich set of contributions from Helen. We are now going to have an opportunity to 
if you get a chance to answer your, qu answer your question to Helen in person, she'll be having a cup of coffee next door for a short while before having to do some media interviews. But I want to thank you very much indeed, Helen. You could see the number of hands up going around the room. Everybody wants to talk about this. Yeah. It was a fantastic primer, I think, mm. on where we're currently at. There's a long way to go. But I can only mm. thank you for spending a bit of time with us today at ODI. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alison. Thank